Hello, and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. Remember, for those of you out there in ATP land watching us in the United States and around the world, you can always just type into your browser, findberry.com. You'll go right to our website where you can sign up for all of our content to get it on your phone and on your computer absolutely for free. We never charge for content. This is a breaking story. We've got two very important American heroes with us today, two LA firefighters that have a story you are not gonna believe. I wanna introduce you to John Knox and I wanna introduce you to Josh Satley. I hope I'm saying that correctly, gentlemen. And uh, I'd like each of you to tell us your story, basically what happened, uh, what your career was like and how it has ended up because of something called COVID-19 and the VAX. John, let's start with you. Sure, thanks for having us on today. It's great to be here. Um, my name is John Knox. I'm a 22, almost 22 year veteran of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. Um, currently I am off duty, leave no pay pending termination um, for refusing to uh, take a shot against my will. Um, I, uh, I've been with the fire department for, like I said, almost 22 years. Um, you know, I have a family, I have two daughters, um, and this has affected me. And I mean, everyone else that's going through this, uh, in a, in a pretty drastic way, um, at, you know, everybody has a different story, but, um, we, the city of Los Angeles came out in the end of August last year with mandates that stated basically, uh, you shall get vaccinated or be terminated. Um, a group of us felt that that was uh, unconstitutional um, and had many other issues along with that. Um, so we banded together and created uh, our organization that we have now. It's called Firefighters for Freedom. Um, we are a 501c3. Um, our initial uh, chapter was out of the city of Los Angeles. Um, and then since that time, we've actually started a second one that is a national organization, and uh, we're creating chapters across the U.S. right now. All right, so let's um, let's jump let's jump over to Josh uh, before we get too deep into this. Josh, tell us your story real quick, would you please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, Barry, for having us. Um, of course. So, my name is Josh uh, Satley. I was a Beverly Hills firefighter paramedic for about eleven years, and uh, for me, it was uh, it was a dream come true. Every firefighter knows the difficulties and the challenges and struggles it takes, the hours of training, the volunteer time uh, to become a firefighter. So really, it was a, it was a dream come true as an answer to my prayers. Um, married, I have four kids. We live here in Southern California, lived here for quite some time. You know, uh, we couldn't to really love uh, this state. But again, I, I became a firefighter because I really enjoyed helping people. And uh, so to be able to have that career where you have that reward uh, of helping people and you know, it gives you purpose in life. It was really, a, again, a dream come true. And then to be at Beverly Hills, for me, it was the, you know, cream of the crop. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have been happier. Um, it was a dream job. And that all changed for me in, in August, as John said, when these uh, mandates came through. Um, I still recall when the beginning of pandemic hit, a lot of us uh, questioned the seriousness of this disease, and we took it very serious. I remember watching, you know, people dropping dead in China on the news. And so my first encounter with a COVID patient, we didn't know what would happen. And it was before any protocols or policies were put into place. So there was a lot of questions, obviously, that were leading up to that about our safety. And uh, but none of us, John included, and many other first responders ever cowered away from that. We never showed up or, or called in sick out of fear. We always showed up um, and we, you know, we showed up throughout the pandemic, um, you know, and there's so, a lot so of things. Let's, that's let's get into let's get into if we can. The, sure. the order that was given to you. Were you gentlemen, either one of you in any fashion given a choice? In other words, listen, we want you to be vaccinated so you're not spreading the disease. We want you to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, but if you have a problem with our mandate, you can do X, Y, or Z. Was there a choice or was it an order, get the shot or you're, you're out? So they allowed for uh, the shot or one of two carve outs, which was a religious or medical exemption, uh, both of which here in our state are very difficult to get. The medical exemptions, as we know, very difficult to get as doctors are limited as to how many they can give out. And that's thanks to a bill that was passed for the school children several years ago. And then the religious exemption, I was told from my police or my um, fire chief that you had to either be Dutch reformist or a Christian scientist to receive a religious exemption. 
We later found that wasn't true. I actually tried to go through those hoops. I tried to follow those procedures. I filled out a religious exemption and it was denied. It wasn't good enough. I had to subject myself to an interview with the head of HR in a Zoom meeting, much like this one, where she listened to my deeply held religious beliefs. She judged me on no criteria. There was no special training on her behalf. And then I received an email about two days later, just stating that I didn't receive one. And at that point, I had a choice to be vaccinated or they were going to relieve me of duty um, and potentially terminate me. And ultimately, that's what that's what ended up happening. But that happened October 1st. They, they relieved me of duty. They ignored my due process. And then they terminated me finally in, in March. So your crime, if I get this straight, and I'm not being silly, was you're not a Dutch reform or you're not a Christian science. And because you're not of those religions, your religion isn't good enough to get an exemption. Is, is that what you were told? That's what I was told, but that's not even what they followed. Uh, the fire chief came upstairs and told us you had to be one of those two religions. Well, when we did our religious interviews, there were about 22 that were submitted, these religious exemptions. They accepted 14, and all those individuals are Christian of some kind. And in fact, one individual didn't even claim faith. He just said that it's his you know, belief that he's like a, a natural uh, you know, type of person that doesn't take medications. They accepted his. Uh, mine, on the other hand, I'm very Christian um, you know, and, and uh, have strong faith my whole life. And I explained that to him. I explained to him that I prayed about it and under no circumstances will I take this vaccine and that will not change. And that was based on a prayer and my own personal revelation and a choice that I made between me and God. And that wasn't good enough for them. So they ended up denying mine and a couple others as well. Just very arbitrary. So you picked the wrong God, apparently, <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess. John, how, how were you told, get the jab or get out? Yeah, so for us at LA City, um, it was along the similar lines. I mean, originally, you know, when the the shot started coming out in March of uh, twenty, was that twenty one? Where are we? Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, we had the choice. You know, there was there was no forcing it or whatever. You know, uh, first responders had the ability to get that uh, if you wanted it. And for me, I made a choice you know, not to, um, based on my medical background and so on and so forth and research that I had done. Um, at that time, it wasn't for me. So moving through the pandemic, it was never an issue until August. And then all of a sudden, within 30 days of that ordinance coming out, you know, you became criminalized. Um, and yeah, so let, let me let me just stop you a minute. I want to tell our viewers, uh, I looked it up, the LA City Council voted 13 to zero, unanimous that all city employees had to be fully vaccinated. And I guess that's a moving target. It used to be one, then two, then two plus a booster. I don't know if there's a second booster now, or you're gonna get fired. And my understanding is 600 LA city firefighters, your brothers and sisters have said no. And you're suing the city of Los Angeles? Yes. Yeah, so, so they gave us kind of like what Josh did. They said, go ahead and uh, take the shot or you have your carve out of a exemption, medical or religious. And in that, what they did, you know, they had to make reasonable accommodation for you because they, they felt that we were an imminent threat to the public and the workforce. Um, so you know, we did have individuals that put in uh, for religious exemptions. We do have some that put in for medical, um, but the process, there was no process in, in how to do that. Right. Um, and so for me, I felt that based on the constitution, which in the state of California, both the federal and the state, but the state of California's constitution is the strongest constitution in the United States of America. And the constitution protects my God-given inalienable rights. And one of those is free agency or free will, the ability to make choices for myself. And in the state of California, um, it provides me the right to medical privacy. They don't have the ability to ask me that question. It provides the right for body autonomy um, and also for protecting my genetic information. And so to me, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm a religious individual. I believe I'm a Christian. Um, but to me, standing on my God-given rights and that the Constitution is protecting those, I don't need a 
religious exemption. So I have not filed for that because I knew that this was what was going to happen, uh, that they were going to, they'd been denying them. Um, and so now once they deny that, or they say you have to have reasonable accommodation, that means that they have to have somewhere specific that's quote unquote safe where they can put you away from the public and the rest of the workforce. Well, that doesn't exist. I mean, unless you put me in a bubble. So what's, uh, so what's the latest with this lawsuit? I mean, it's an enormous lawsuit. And at one time, half of the LA fire department was refusing the jab. I, what's the latest on that? And what's the latest with the lawsuit? So the, we have about a thousand plaintiffs in the lawsuit right now. Um, and it has gone through different iterations of the courts. Unfortunately, the courts here are very biased. Um, we have a judge that is very biased and it's gone through where he pretty much every time we've been in front of the judge, he sidestepped all of the issues that we brought to, uh, you know, to his attention regarding that. Um, and basically at this point, he has now denied or thrown the lawsuit out. So we are actually in the process of uh, working on getting him removed through the ju judicial branch, through the uh, uh, judicial review committee uh, on having him removed from the case based on his biasness and the fact that he is unable to actually address the issues that we bring to uh, the table in the, in the court case. Um, and so we're also working on an appeal with that as well at, at this time. Got it. And is there litigation as well in Beverly Hills? Drop? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we also filed, we had to file separately because we're a separate fire department and uh, city. Um, there was about 22 plaintiffs that filed a lawsuit back in December. The city tried to weaken our case by making some accommodations and some agreements with our association, which is our, our union. Um, we had to go back and amend that. And then in between that time, um, before they were able to respond, they actually ended up terminating me. So we had the lawsuit filed. Um, I was off on unpaid leave. So we made all those complaints and uh, it wasn't until about March 9th, they terminated me. So we had to go ahead and amend that. And we refiled with the wrongful termination suit. And uh, we might be picking up some more plaintiffs on that case as well, um, because there's a lot of individuals who had the first round of shots and they don't want to do the boosters. And so there's some issues with filling out more exemptions for that. And obviously they want to fight any future um, boosters. I mean, there's going to be every, what, six months or a year, like you said, it, it, who knows how, how many they're going to subject themselves. Fauci, Fauci is now predicting it's forever. So what, what happens to your pensions? I mean, everybody that, that does a job like you guys are doing, and, and thank you for your service, we're, we're all indebted to the people that run into the burning building rather than run away from the burning building. And that's you guys. Um, you're unemployed, basically. You're not getting paid from your employer. What happened to your pensions? So it, it all depends on where you sit, um, at least for the city of Los Angeles. I believe it's probably the same for Beverly Hills. Um, technically, you can't collect a pension until you have over 20 years on. Um, at that point, then you have the ability if you want to retire and um, uh, receive a portion of your pension. Um, so for the individuals that have less than 20 years, basically they get nothing. They get the money that they put into their pension at that time, um, plus the interest that they've earned through that, but there is no pensionable benefits. Um, anyone after the 20 year mark, technically they do receive a pension. Um, so it just kind of depends on where you're at. So in, uh, in your case, John, how close were you to qualifying for pension for the rest of your life? Well, <laughs> that's actually a, a good question. So I have almost 22 years on. So technically, I mean, I could get a portion of my pension. Um, but unfortunately, I had come down and I, I had been sick for about two and a half years. I was off duty um, dealing with a, an illness. And so through that time, I lost some of my pensionable time. So when I went back to work, technically right now, I'm sitting about four and a half, five months short of being able to collect a pension. Uh, so so let, me, let me stop you there. You're four months roughly short of qualifying for full pension rights. What does that mean for you financially? 
let's say you you would have another god willing 40 years to collect on your pension how much money is that that you're not going to get <laughs> Well, uh, I haven't sat down and worked the, the numbers because it would probably make me ill <laughs> again. Um, yeah, I mean, I still have, I mean, at 20, so I, I couldn't collect a full pension until 33 years on the job and I've got 21 and a half or so right now. So, I mean, I still have the ability to work, you know, another 13 15 years um and so if they if they let you but they're telling you don't come to work you're a danger to society right correct yes and i'm and i'm wor being worked through the the uh, termination process right now um uh if i i can't give you a date on that but it would probably be i would think in the next month or so i mean unless something changes um but so you know there's a large and i'm not a spring chick i'm 53 years old um you know i mean that's still young but it's not like for me to go out to another fire department, nobody wants to hire a 53 year old fireman, right? I mean, even though I'm in shape and, and I can do the job, it's not a problem. You know, it's much easier for them to hire somebody who's 18, 20, 25 years old, you know, um, versus somebody who's on the back half of their career. So uh, it, it's an interesting predicament uh, and it creates a situation that, you know, you're starting all over. Um, I put, you know, I mean, I worked uh, almost 12 years as a deputy sheriff prior to being with the fire department for 21 years. So, you know, I've spent my life uh, in public service and now it's just an awkward feeling to be treated as that individual that's the problem. And yeah, I, reality, I'm not, I'm standing I, up for my, my heart goes, my heart goes out to you and I'm sure everyone watching this feels the same way. You've been screwed. <laughs> Josh, let me ask you a question. We'll start with you, Josh. The um, new person in Washington, Walensky, uh, now says that at NIH that um, Rochelle Walensky, I guess is how you say it now, um, that the vaccination does not prevent the transmission of COVID. So your first responders, you're the guys out there when people are bleeding and dying or worse. And if you were vaccinated, you could still transmit the virus. Does this make any sense to you? Why, why make it so urgent for you to get the virus vaccine when the virus vaccine does not prevent the virus? Can you explain that to me? Because for the life of me, not a doctor, but it doesn't make sense. Josh, That's what's your take? That's a great question. We, we've been asking that from the beginning. In the beginning, they told us that. Oh, yeah, it'll, it'll prevent, right? And then we found out shortly thereafter it doesn't prevent. Then they told us that, oh, well, it will help reduce the symptoms. Okay, well, if it helps reduce the symptoms, it sounds like an individual choice. So why do I have to take it for you? And that was a common question. We also brought up natural immunity. I, received, I had COVID. I had COVID. Uh, actually, I had the Omicron variant, and I had Delta back uh, about a year ago or so. And so I've recovered, um, you know, I went through it. I lost my taste. That was the worst part for me, but there was a lot of firefighters that, that had that. And so when we got into this, we said, well, can we check our antibody levels? And will that suffice? Because from what we know, I'm a paramedic, I'm not a doctor, but I do know a little bit about medicine. And from what I understand, natural immunity, a lot of times is stronger than an actual vaccine, a man-made product. So we asked those questions. None of those were ever on the table. So we had a lot of those common sense questions that you just posed that they just seem to ignore or pretend like they don't exist. Um, and there's a lot of differential treatment with the paramedics and with the firefighters, which again, doesn't make sense. So if you're vaccinated right now, you have to test daily and you have to wear full PPE. I'm sorry, if you're unvaccinated. So un unvaccinated individuals have to wear full PPE. So I'm talking mask, goggles, gown, gloves, and they have to test daily. If you're vaccinated, you don't have to do any of those things. But like you just said, they can still contract and spread this disease. So why are they excluded and why are we singling out those individuals that have an exemption? You know, just making yeah, there, their there are studies health. now coming in from around the world. And I can think of a couple of them I've just read in the last week that natural immunity is actually better for you to not get COVID-19 and not to transmit COVID-19 than being triple or quadruple vaxxed because the body with its natural immunity is better than what you can make in a laboratory. So if you've had it, chances are you won't get it again and you won't transmit it. 
But if you've been vaxxed, I know somebody, a very close friend of our family, she's had four vaccinations and she's been in bed twice for two weeks each time with COVID. And yeah, when I, mean, I asked, so why did you get the vaccine? She goes, well, I didn't die. And I go, <laughs> well, yeah, you didn't die. Okay. But you got COVID the same as if you were vaccinated or unvaccinated. And she had no response. And when you ask that question, crickets, nothing? Nothing. And I think this last Omicron variant really highlighted the fact that the vaccine doesn't do anything. Um, we had hundreds of firefighters sick here in LA County, also San Diego, Orange County, all throughout the country. I was contacting people in DC. They were reporting similar numbers to where about 80% of those that were at home sick were those that were vaccinated. So explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. That's why we're yeah. having this discussion. <laughs> we're all smart people and it doesn't make any sense to us. So tell me, gentlemen, what are you guys doing about it? I understand there's a rally in Los Angeles. Tell us about it. Yeah. So this weekend, um, there is a second. So in January, there was Defeat the Mandates in D.C. Um, and we were at that and that was a fantastic event. Um, and then they have brought that out here to the West Coast. So this weekend on Sunday, April 10th, starting at noon, there is the Defeat the Mandates rally in downtown Los Angeles at Grand Park. Um, and it's going to have a wide variety of speakers, uh, quite a few speakers from that were in D.C. as well. Both Josh and I will be there speaking. Um, and then we have also coordinated a march to the Mandates uh, uh, rally not rally, but a march <clears throat> that's going to be leaving uh, in, from in front of Fire Station 4, LA City Fire Station 4, which is at 450 East Temple Street in Los Angeles. And it will be marching through downtown and then end up over at the rally at the beginning uh, of the rally. Um, again, to bring awareness to the fact that, you know, these mandates are wrong, unconstitutional, and, you know, you should have freedom of choice. Well said. Uh Josh, where can people find out about you on the web? So you can find out about us at firefightersforfreedom.org. Um, feel free to look at our all of our stories there. There's a donation tab too, which covers legal fees and also helps us to fight um, really to keep our jobs, but also just to help protect the freedoms of Americans. That's also what we're after. Um, you can also look at us uh, or find us on Instagram at Firefighters for Freedom. Uh, you can find me at JSAT30. Um, and uh, follow all the stories there. We try to push out the real world stuff of what's going on. You're not going to find this on your ABC news or your other alphabet news. You're going to have to go to the people on the streets, the boots on the grounds and get the real stories of what's going on and how these mandates affect us and how they affect the community. It's very dangerous. Got it. How about you, John? Is, do you have a separate place to find out about John? Um, yeah, you can go to, uh, to mine. It's uh, Johnny Knoxville 911. Um, that's my personal account, but again, same thing, firefightersforfreedom.org. You can find out about us there. Um, we do put out a lot of information. I mean, here in California, you know, people right now, uh, you start to see that mandates are loosening up. They're kind of pulling back in different areas, right? Uh, we have a, a group of individuals in, in DC and, and all around the country that have kind of, uh, you know, re attempted to remove our freedoms, right? And now uh, we have this election cycle that's coming up and, and they're easing that and, and starting to be like, they're the ones that are re retained or got us our freedoms back, I think is the words I wanna use. But what you're seeing is the mandates are being uh, lifted in places except for Los Angeles um, and New York. But then at the same time in Los Angeles and the whole state of California, the assembly, you know, the Senate bills that they're pushing through like we had a Senate bill 1993 here in California that basically stated every employee of a public and or private company and independent contractors shall be vaccinated or cannot work in the state of California. Think about that. Unbelievable. Think about the ramifications of that. So there, instead of, you know, mandates are illegal, right? It's the sidestepping around the legislature. So now they loosen up on that. And now when everybody is asleep, focusing on other events in the, the news, you know, the other shiny coin that's going on, uh, they're trying to pass these bills that are 
put it actually into law now for everyone, not just, you know, first responders and, and public workers. It's terrifying. Good luck on Sunday, guys, uh, on both your march and the rally. Um, again, I want to thank you both for your service to our fellow Californians, the guys and gals that rush in first instead of rush away are the ones we ought to be thanking, are the ones we ought to be supporting, and the ones we ought to be standing with, not making you the other, but you deserve our loyalty, support, and gratitude. And at least from my perspective, thank you. And thanks for thank coming. You. Thanks for thank having you. us on.